I have known this individual for a quarter century plus, and I'm going to stop talking about him as if he's not looking at me to my right. <laughs> he is the voice of college football and tennis on the worldwide leader in sports. My friend Chris Fowler here in studio. Good to see you, sir. Rich, it's, I'm, I'm dizzy at all the platforms we're talking on right now. Oh, I'm not trying to sort that out, but I'm, <laughs> great to see you. We, we were at your you. mother-in-law's living room a couple weeks ago, and uh, well, here we are. That's not a metaphor for anything, by the wow. way. Another nice we setting. literally were. Wow. But, uh, yeah, on the, upper, on the Upper West Side. How about we're that? in town, yes, exactly right. Good to see you, sir. Good Happy to see to you. You bet. Same to you. Um, so what number um, national championship games is this for you? Coming up on nine. Monday. This is this is the ninth year of the playoff, and and Kirk and I have had the good fortune of calling now nine championship games and what is it, eighteen out of the twenty seven playoff games, and grateful for that every day. Now, none, what, none quite like this though. I will say this is a different feel from the other eight. Why is that? TCU. That's a story we've never seen in college football. I mean, two hundred to one preseason to make the playoff, mm -hmm. which makes them probably a thousand to one to win the championship, and here we are. I mean, it's not supposed to happen in this sport. Basketball, okay. Right. Get Butler, get Gonzaga before they were a powerhouse. You get in there and play for a championship. But football is supposed to be for only the five or six elite programs that everybody knows who have been in the playoff every year. And here's TCU with five dudes who had been to any bowl game before this year. Not, not the playoff, any bowl game. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, a, it's the craziest, unlikeliest roster to ever get here. And that makes it interesting. Now they got to take down... You know, big bad bulldogs who walk into the ring wearing the belt from last year. So, I mean, Georgia's a favorite for a reason. I'm not trying to sell or spin the game right. because people know Georgia should win. But I just think that the landscape for this game, it's almost you have to keep reminding yourself it's a championship game and TCU's in it, you know? Yeah, and, and I, you're kind of touching on something that we talked about on our show yesterday while you were coming back from Joshua Tree, where we saw on your Instagram <laughs> feed. Um, that uh, that this, I believe, is the beginning of the way we're going to be seeing college football play out forever with the 12-team playoff coming. Uh, and by that, I mean um, not only TCU making it and a team that you didn't think could, now you're going to have more of that pool of teams that you don't think could making a playoff yeah. and potentially going on a run. And then, two, the game that you called the Peach Bowl – you know, my alma mater goes into the home of its longstanding rival and curb stomps them. Yep. And they still have a chance to win the national championship anyway and damn near made this game up to the last second. I think that's the way these things are going to go right now, that your your longstanding rival could potentially beat you. And whereas you used to leave them yeah. behind and buried, no longer. You, they can make a playoff and go on a run and win the whole damn yeah, thing. Yeah, it's a big conversation. I mean, Ohio State made it because Tennessee got shocked by South Carolina. Right. And because Utah came back with Caleb Williams, hurt his hamstring, and pounded USC. They, those things had to happen to get yes. Ohio State in the bracket. But I think that when you, when you have an expanded playoff, inclusion is good. Um, more teams involved in the conversation is good. I thought, though, Rich, that you can bring it to eight or 12, whatever. Yes. You're still going to have the same four. So TCU has blown that up. I thought that do what you want, have a bigger bracket. Teams can call themselves playoff teams. Conferences can stay in play. Fan bases in all parts of the country can be involved. Yes. That's all good. But after you play the first round of the quarterfinals, you're going to still have the Bamas, Georgias, Clemsons, Ohio States, Michigan, you're going to have the same teams battling for the championship because it's just too hard to win multiple playoff games. Now, TCU, you know, Michigan was complicit in their own demise. I think we've probably <laughs> litigated that here plenty, right? That's a great what, – what, what, what tour – that like, sounds like somebody's tour name, right? It's the complicit in their own demise tour. Well, you know, Des, I know Des was on the Peloton this morning at the hotel gym, and he's still pissed off about the call, the touchdown. I said – as Which call? Well, I mean, was okay, it the, what, right. the call on the goal line? No, no, the call. The, the Michigan call when the guy's butt was in the end oh, zone thought, when he caught the ball, but they took off the no, board but, and they fumbled the next play. That was the main call. You no, know, no, 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 no. The, 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 but to buttress your point, sir, uh, I thought <laughs> oh, you meant. Oh, God, I'm sorry. No, sorry, fellas. I didn't mean to. No, 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 no. no. I, thought, <laughs> uh, I thought the call right. you meant was Michigan's call on oh, fourth and two. The, their play calls. The, the Ann yes. Arbor special that came out of nowhere. I, I you tried know, to, I don't know what to divert Desmond's attention to those calls that the staff made and not the ones the officials made, he wasn't having it. But, hey, that's I, I get it. I right. mean, it was it was a disappointing result, obviously, for Michigan fans. And, right. and you know, I, I, I just screening the game back because, obviously, we were getting ready for our Peach Bowl game. 
and, and I'm watching it back, you know, in great detail. And there were so many chances after they clawed back in the game. And then you give up a 75 yard touchdown on a crossing route, um, which he pointed out was a pick play. I pointed out the ball was thrown behind the line. So then we get into a whole thing in the God. gym about this with the rule. I, I, was there a third person I, in the gym listening to this opened. whole thing? I mean, it's <laughs> a third person in the gym going, wait a minute. Well, I have I mean, to get I in did, between these two guys who I watch on TV? In the, in the morning when no. he was trying to have a, a bike, but no. No, I, but I know what you're saying. Like, again, but TCU deserves yeah, to be there, they do. you know, and, and they're. First of all, they're a lot better than people think. Okay. They, they no have question. a roster, even though that they hadn't been in, in bowl games before. He, Sonny Dykes comes in and assembles. Um, a, a great roster of of portal guys keeps guys there who are out the door who say, yeah. wait a minute, we got the Sunny Dykes offense. I can stay and make plays. Quentin Johnston, Darius Davis, Tay Barber. They have a receiving core that that is is arguably mm -hmm. as good or better than the one Georgia faced with Ohio State, especially when you took Marvin Harrison out of the equation, and that really did change that game. So they're very capable of, of gashing Georgia's secondary, working the middle of the field where the dogs have been more vulnerable than the edges, and making big plays. If they can't get to Max Duggan, I mean, don't be surprised to see TCU score points. Mm -hmm. Now, can they stop Georgia's physicality and Georgia's weapons on offense is another question. Chris Fowler here on the Rich Eisen Show here in Los Angeles, calling the national championship game with Kirk, uh, Kirk Herbstreet and the rest of the worldwide leader in sports crew here. Um, so... <sighs> Did you realize in the moment that as Ruggles was attempting the game-winning field goal, the ball was dropping in Times Square at the very same second? Like, were you yeah, aware I mean, of that we had all? we actually had New Year's Rock and Eve, Dick Clark, hosted by Ryan Seacrest, on our monitor wall because <laughs> we had to constantly promote it, and so we had a little. And you know, we it became a topic of conversation. Herbsey goes, "Have you actually been to that?" Yeah. I lived in New York for a long time, as you know, and I did once when I was young and dumb actually go to Times Square. Is that right? Just to have an experience. As, Which New as Year's you would. was that? Which oh, was in the, it was in the late eighties. Late eighties. Yes. In your in your Scholastic Sports America <laughs> yeah, it was days. Before I was ESPN? busy every other New Year's Eve covering yes. college football. Yes. So, uh, he was just incredulous that I had gone to that. I said, "Well, you know, <laughs> come on, you're young in New York. You, you do it once, right? You do it once, and then you realize, yeah, you, you know, never, why did I? It do wasn't this? the worst New Year's Eve I had in New York." Getting pickpocketed at a club was worse than that. <laughs> but, you know, it, it wasn't my favorite New Year's Eve either. But you know what it is? You get to New Year's Eve, you cover the Rose Bowl. I mean, you celebrate East Coast New Year's, and yeah. then you kind of tuck it in. Because right. your wake-up call is 4 o'clock. Yes. To go out and sit in a frigid Rose Bowl stadium. I don't believe I've... Uh, Susie and I, with our three kids, have have <laughs> seen the midnight. We we celebrate 9 o'clock. And, yeah. and in, in our house, uh, you know, we were watching you yeah. and Kirk you. call the game, of course. And Zan, our oldest, is just like, are we going to see the ball drop? And I had to keep back and forth in between plays saying, see, the ball hasn't dropped well, yet. To get back to your question, it was incredible because yeah. we were aware. First of all, the game was going really long, right? Yes. It was supposed to be last year's semifinal game when also Michigan was on the different end of the score. Yes. Um, we were in Miami on the tarmac to take off to come out to the Rose Bowl yes. and watching the fireworks from from the plane. So this game ran much longer than that. And and I started to notice, boy, it's almost 23 here. It, it, yeah. and, and then they told me in my ear, literally, because Kirby Smart froze him with the one timeout, that by yeah. the time he kicked it, it was kicked in 22 and landed... <laughs> It wasn't in the air very long, but it still spanned into the new year. It was 23 when they were signaling no good. And we're never going to have that again. No, I hope not. Because do you know how many people are probably having arguments in their households about, you know, what, you know, what, what the hell to watch? I Our mean, buddy Tariko texted me and says the yeah. first time he had not flipped over and watched the ball drop in his life. And I said, well, I'm glad you stuck with us. I he mean, stuck with it. He's yeah. hardcore. <laughs> He's hardcore. If Syracuse was in the game, he definitely wouldn't have switched over. But yeah, I mean, what a game that was, man. Yeah. I mean, what a like, CJ Stroud, best game he's ever played, right? Would he you played say? as hard. Yeah, but the Rose Bowl out here would have been. Oh, that's but, true. But his two postseason games that he's played, you know, tearing Perfect. up Utah. But this was Georgia. This wasn't Georgia using running backs at corner, which, in, which Utah did a year ago. In the state of Georgia. This was as going well. down to the Bulldogs' backyard and yeah. ripping apart that defense. And the way he did it toughness, scrambling, doing things he's not known for, being physical as a runner, tucking it. Yes. And and I think that you felt badly for him because it's his last game at Ohio State. And I, I get a little soft late in my career. I, I really do feel awful for the teams and the individuals you've gotten to know and respect 
when, when they, they come short and their career is suddenly over. And you saw a moment of respect between Bennett and Stroud, and you saw the realization almost on CJ's face, like, this is it. Now, he's going to play on Sundays. Some of the guys you saw in that game will never put the pads on again. And that's the same thing Monday night here. Yeah, that's right. They're, 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 it's not just that their college career is over. Their football career is over, right? For the vast majority yes. of the guys whose eligibility is gone, that's no, it. No doubt. They'll never feel that. I actually get goosebumps talking about that because that's what's so powerful about these postseason games, you know, whether it's a semi or a championship game. One team is done. Mm-hmm. And a lot of guys on that team are done forever, you know? So... So it's uh, it's great. Is this their first trip to so far? Have you been in the building? I have yet? not been in the building. I'm amazing. excited. It's amazing. It's Herb loud. Street's giving me a great scouting report. Is that everybody else who's been in there? Right. Says the booth is nice. It's a. I mean, absolutely. Al might have left you something behind or something like I that. I love the stadium, but for those of you, the 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 office is the booth. That's what really matters. Is yeah. there a bathroom? Yes. Is it within <laughs> the same zip code as the playing surface? Are you not in the clouds? Okay. <laughs> Do you not need oxygen to, to work up there? And, that, you know, all the NFL booths are positioned much differently than many of the college booths. So I get excited to go into the, something like this where the office is spectacular it, and, it is, and the it, stadium looks pretty. So It's amazing. It's really bright and it's loud in there because, again, it's a canopy over. It's an outdoor stadium, by the yeah, way. I know. And there's a canopy over it and it gets really loud. It's going to be it's an incredible spot. This last year's Super Bowl, was a, it was a, it's a great big time spot but nothing does beat the rose bowl that you were at last week too i mean what's that like for you to call a game at the rose bowl chris what's that like man? religious experience Isn't i mean it? i i mean i think that that that's one of the shrines for me wimbledon center court and the rose bowl kind of stand alone so so anything that happens you know on those playing surfaces is elevated because it's the rose bowl and i think that you get the feeling you've been to those games you everyone in there even when the weather's not perfect yes feels like there's no place else on earth I'd rather be than right in this spot right now. Utah fans took it over for the second consecutive year, um, but Penn State fans went away happy. Yeah, and I, I think that um, I, I'm just I'm I'm blessed. I think Kirk and I have called I think seven Rose Bowls. He, he's analyzed more than anybody in history, and and so in in our 27 years working together, we we've talked a lot about what sort of what the Rose Bowl means to two kids who grew up in the Midwest. Or you turn on the TV on New Year's Day and just the quality of light, which is this golden afternoon light and the yeah. warm temperatures. And you know, I, I still feel like the the same. I took my shoes off, by the way. I on, saw that. Yeah. I decided to uh to do your- what is called earthing or grounding. So plenty of people in California would know what that is. You, and you Green take, Bay, I guess, too. I mean, you, you, you take your, your shoes, shoes off and you put Rogers your feet on, on your grass. And it has so what is powerful that? effect on you. Seriously, tell me what this is again. Like you took your it's shoes off. It's called earthing or grounding. And if you walk around on grass, yeah. which I try to do as early every day as I can when we're in Miami. Yes. I don't walk around the pavement on the Upper West Side, <laughs> but I try to get to Riverside Park or something. And yeah. you take your shoes off and you feel the earth. And it has a, anything primal like that, right? Mm-hmm. We're, we're, now we're really deviating. People, what the hell are you talking about? No, it, it's, you just came from Joshua it, Tree. It's, it's you feel the sun on your face. Yeah, yeah. It's still, and you feel your feet yeah. on the ground. And yes. I thought, why not do it here? The grass was cool and damp. And I, bowl. I I took the shoes off and rolled up the, uh, the the dress pant legs. And I walked around for a while and I felt great. And so, yeah. That I, I did, Kirk's kid took a picture of it, so I posted it. I saw that on your <laughs> yeah. Instagram. I saw that. Yeah. Still here with uh, with Chris Fowler. Yeah, we were looking across the way. It's not on camera. It's behind uh, Brockman. Those are two seats from the Rose Bowl that we got from uh, oh. from the Rose Bowl. Our friend Deedon Brozino of the Rose Bowl sent it to us, and we've had anybody who's played in the game sign it. Um, so you, if you can see through Brockman right there, um, you could see there's a seat. That's seat three. Can you see seat three? That's a little square. I don't I know if you can see, see it. Three, oh, yeah, there yes. you can see it right. How uh, cool oh, we can see that. Well, seat that three, right. that that was drawn in by Josh Rosen because that's his number. So he drew in the that's three. That's awesome. Aikman signed it. Who else? Ron yeah, Rivera Aikman, signed Ron it. Ron Rivera, Ryan Lee. Mark Harmon. And Mark Harmon. That's amazing that you have yeah. that and the yeah. energy that those those chairs, while they, while they witness. Right. We were talking about the Rose Bowl Wimbledon comparison. So yes. I, told, I was telling you in break, I have – my, my lovely wife, Jennifer, and my brother, Drew, for my, my birthday this summer, we have an original Wimbledon center court bench, painted green, the colors. It's, it's got four seats in it. And it was 1922. They, they built this thing. It, it was there for the first few decades. Wimbledon center court got bombed. 
in World, World War, War II, II by the Germans. Yeah. So then they swapped some things out. But the original benches were taken and put in storage. And Dick Enberg, our late dear friend and colleague, had had bought this from Wimbledon, brought it back to his house in San Diego. When he passed away, his house was sold to folks who had all these mementos. My brother delivered some art to them. Long story, got in a conversation, expressed to these people how important Dick was to me. I, I met him when I was a little kid, worked with him, shared a house at Wimbledon. Everything that, that I know about that place comes from him. And, you know, they had it sitting around in their garden, kind of rotting, and we convinced them to to and, let us have it have for a price. Bench. And it, it, in Miami, I now have a Wimbledon center court bench waiting to be lovingly restored that Dick Enberg owns. So I, I, I love the story behind those seats over there. Amazing. You got a call from ESPN to say, come join us for the first time when? When did you get that 1986. call? 1986. Jeez. I was a year out of school working in Denver, uh, doing all the the cub reporter things at a, at, a, at a great TV station. Very lucky to have an on-air gig out of school. I went to see you, and it was right down the road. I'd interned there. But I had a little tape out floating around, wanting to you know do scores on the weekends at various local stations. Yeah. And Espen somehow got a hold of the tape, and I thought I was going to get a call for Sports Center. They had, they had a high school show in mind. Mm-hmm. Called Scholastic Sports America, and I, I looked 11 years old. So look at it was that appropriate. picture! Oh my God, 11 is being generous. Look, look at, at that sweater. That. Where's the sweater? Look at you, Fowler. Wow. wow! Look at that, dude. Damn you for finding that picture. No, I, I, uh, <laughs> that sweater is is a that is a catastrophe. What I'm wearing there. It's that all was good. the era when you know, like the Kuji sweaters and the yeah, whole right. kind of. Yes. I had a I had a. You had a whole collection? I had a, like a steamer trunk full of sweaters <laughs> that looked like that. that <laughs> so Scholastic Sports America, yeah. I remember you doing that. I, I, no one said it was a good idea to do it, by the way. This is just uh, not to get off of my life lessons, but sometimes listening to your own inner voice and, and cueing out the static of people who are telling you what you should do, yes. here's the path, is crucial. And nobody said I should go to ESPN because it was this startup thing. It was seven years old. Seven as years you know. old, yeah. yeah. We didn't have the rights to anything really back then. And a high school show was not the pathway into this business for, for a lot of people. So I, I did it because it seemed fun. It seemed like it would be a challenge. And two years later, turned down the opportunity to come out to L.A. for the job they eventually hired Chris Myers for when they, they had no L.A. presence. So mm-hmm. they were going to put a reporter out here for the first time to cover Lakers, Dodgers, USC. and You turned down the NFL. Showtime, Kirk Gibson, Dodge, you know, Lakers Showtime, Kirk Gibson, Dodge. high beat? school show. Again, they, they checked my sanity, but it just didn't, you know, something said this didn't feel right. Something said, stay in Bristol, okay. not go to L.A. I didn't say it. I didn't see it felt logical. I, I, I just, hey, it just. Look, it's, it's where hey, you're man, finished. It's how you finish. Whether, but. whether you, I probably was too young to even meditate back then, but yeah. I figured out that it, then a month later they said, hey, well, how about college football sidelines and be a reporter for this little show called Game Day, which is a half hour long that people were not watching. And that just clicked instantly. So, I mean, none of, we wouldn't be, none of the path I took had I taken um, the conventional choice any point along the way. So. so who was the first host of Game Day? Who was hosting? Tim Brando. Tim Brando. Tim Brando. Tim Brando. Who's Timmy Fox v. now. Did, did a couple years. Then Bob right. Carpenter hosted it in 89. Um, his wife was giving birth. He left town to be with her, obviously. I was always pulled up from, from AAA yeah. and put in that host seat. Hadn't done live hosting before. And it wasn't a disaster. So the next year, um, when when Bob moved on, I, I was I was tabbed to host it with Lee Corso. Look at that. There we go. Oh, my God. Look at you and you Lee pointing the camera. camera. Yeah, we did, brother. Yeah. Wow. Awesome. And that that show, people go, how would you, how are you doing game day at that age? Well, no one wanted to do it, really. I mean, it was it was one of the biggest sources of pride I'll ever have, as you know, is just building something brick by brick. You get a very few chances in life to do that, correct? And in this business to do that, you you've done it here by sort of starting something. But but game day was was a, a core group of people, including Lee Corso, of course, who who were there from the start. And, and built it into something. And, and uh, 25 years was a great run. Uh, I don't miss the wake-up call. But, I bet. Uh, when, would, but yeah, when, did, when did they, when did you first put that, when did the idea, like, let's go to the campuses. Let's get that energy. Well, it let's took go a few to the years kids. to convince them to spend the money in, in the regular season. You right. We cover bowl games. But 93, Florida State, Notre Dame, one versus two in South Bend in November, had everything you could want. Right. Colts, Bowden, North, South. I mean, it was going to decide which team was going to go on and play for the championship. 
and we convinced them to, we didn't have a clue what we were doing. We are out there using live their mics. We couldn't be heard indoors in South Bend, outside of their basketball arena in the Hall of Fame where all the statues are. Yeah. And we just kind of plopped the set down on the floor and put a rope around it, and, and that was it. And so it, it kind of went okay. And then next year we started to go on the road. And that's, that's obviously what, what catapulted the show was, was differentiating from everything else, which is the, the students and the people behind us were, were members of the cast of the show. And, and you, you feel the energy sitting yeah. at home. You feel the energy and you were such a, a terrific host and conduit for the lack of a better phrase, yeah. to, to, to give everybody that sense sitting at home of what you were sensing and yeah. feeling at the site. And it's intoxicating. It's intoxicating. And kids love it. Well, they were intoxicated behind us. It's true. I mean, I, I, we, we tried to stay sober, but... <laughs> Some of the signs, oh, too. Yeah. Like people, I mean, it's, it's, now, it's now a... It is now, <laughs> where's game day going? You know, now it is now part of... Absolutely. Forevermore. Well, it was organic. The landscape. That's what was cool is that, you know, when it, when it began and, and, and grew, it was organic. It, it, was, it sort of... We, we, We've got bigger and bigger crowds. Coaches begin to figure out, hey, this is an infomercial. Yes. Let's put five or 10,000 people behind them and show the world right. what our campus is like when, when a big game is here and, and use that as a recruiting tool. So, you know, motives, whether they're pure or not, it was an organic growth of the show. And I think our job was to differentiate what was different about Texas A&M from Oregon from Florida. You know, we didn't want it to be the same every week, even though there were some common ingredients. There's different cultures. There's different parts totally. of the country. And, and, and the morning of a game isn't the same in Eugene as it is in Gainesville. You know, so you want to sure. sort of capture that. And uh, and then uh, whose idea was it for Corsa to put a, a headgear on? His. His idea. He used to be like a baseball head, and then he was at Ohio State. He saw Brutus, Buckeye, and uh, Kirk Herbstreet's wife, Allison, was part of the cheer squad, and she had connections because no one had touched that thing. Like, you know, <laughs> certain, certain things are sacred. <laughs> like, you can't. Touch the mask. The idea that you should take off Brutus's head yes. and put it on a human on TV was shocking. Blasphemy. Shocking. It, it almost yeah. was blasphemy. So it, 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 it's like stealing the king's crown. And how do you like me now? But but it, that we convinced them. Kirk convinced them. Allison convinced them. And, and he did it. And obviously, instant connection. You just know right away that it's TV gold. And then every other school wanted in on that. Yeah. So, yeah. So the first ever headgear was the actual headgear of Brutus. It was. And then he put he put on Brutus. The, the most recent pick he's made, I think, was he picked Ohio State to beat Georgia. had the same Brutus head on in, in Atlanta. So I think it's the most picked mascot. I think we've been there a lot, and I think he's picked them a lot. Sure. So. I mean, and it's just, uh, I mean, Rod Woodson tells me a great story of him being recruited into college. And how, you know, he was Mr. Indiana, right. Rod. And so I, I asked him, like, you know, you went to Purdue. What about Indiana? Like, did, and he said, Corso <laughs> recruited. Did I tell you this story? Did I ever tell you this story? I think, I think Lee told it to me is at it, one point. Okay, <laughs> so is that, is, that, is that he's at his house. Corso's coming to visit him. Corso rings the doorbell and sits down in, in the living room and says, you know, Rod, um, I just heard on the radio on the way over here that I've been fired. But Indiana is a great place, and you should still go there. That was the recruiting pitch to Rod Woodson to go play football for the Indiana Hoosiers. And, you know. That's kind of kind of course so it was, but they were fired on the radio. That's how he found he, out. It's what he said. I just heard on the radio, I've been fired. That was the place that gave him go. a lifetime contract and then apparently declared him dead. <laughs> the president had just told him, you're, you're good. And then, boom. But you back in the day, like Woodson must not have been a, a blue chip guy. Oh, they they must was. have missed. But he, but how how was Michigan and Ohio State not in on he him? He said he went to Michigan and and he saw Bo, a Bo peel the paint off the walls during a halftime speech that they were up in a game. He goes, "That's not my guy. That's not because for Bo me. and Woody used to give Corso when he was in Indiana a list of guys they didn't want. Like this guy, he'd be good for you. No, we don't want him. No, these guys, no, <laughs> come no. on, really. You would give him a list of, here's well, some Indiana guys we have no, so you should go on. Here's the on guys in the case. Big Ten region yeah. that, that we can't take. And by the way, there was no 85 scholarship limit, so you right. could take a lot of guys yes, right. back then. Right. But but rather than, he knew he wasn't going to beat those guys head-to-head -head in recruiting. So they, they just were doing him a favor by, hey, here's some guys we think are good, but not good enough for us, but they're good for you. Right. So you recruit him, and then <laughs> we'll beat you by 40. But yeah, knock yourself out. Do you have a good favorite Corso story that you can tell people here? That go through your mind uh, like a good, a good. Other than dropping an f bomb on the air in Houston when he <laughs> did he really? You don't know that story? No, I don't. 
Oh, it's on YouTube, <laughs> folks. I mean, do you, you know this story, Chris? You're looking. I mean, no, I, okay. think I think I've seen it. Okay. I mean, what do you do? Well, we had guest pickers. Yes. Houston played SMU. Carl Lewis, ex Houston great, was yes. the guest picker. SMU was the big underdog. But at that point, Lee liked to fake left, go right. Mm -hmm. So rather than being straightforward, Houston's the obvious pick. Yes. Rather than do that, he had to build up some theater. So SMU's colors are red, white, and blue. And he's going through this whole thing where SMU, America's team, red, white, and blue. And he was going to point to the cheerleaders and reference them, point to the Mustang mascot and reference him and build this whole thing about how could you not love SMU and then go, whoop, cougar head, gotcha. Right. <laughs> But in a moment of live television, he wasn't in sync with the director. <laughs> and I don't even know if he believed his BS, period. Yes. So he's trying to build up SMU. The visuals are not matching. And he's getting a little frustrated. And I still don't think I can say what he said because you, one of these platforms is probably no, over that's the true. air. Yes, and, you, you need know, to so. clean it up. That's correct. So, so he finally just gives up and goes, Ah, F it. <laughs> and grabs grabs the cougar head and puts it on. I've never seen this. You never saw it? No. Oh, you got you to go on YouTube. I got it. I'll show so, you. so what do you do? We'll show you I go like this and just go <laughs> forehead on desk. Yeah, 2011. Kirk 2011. literally distances himself by pushing his chair <laughs> away from the desk and wheeling it as far as he can get from Corso. <laughs> Carl Lewis is laughing, going... Yeah. He's looking at Kirk. Good thing they have seven second delay. <laughs> and Kirk's going, no. <laughs> no, we don't. And because, Rich, you know, you, you've been oh in, in live settings where there's a lot of noise. Sure. You know, we have these double earpieces that are that, that completely block out outside noise and they're super loud. You got to crank it really loud to get over yes. the crowd. So I hear <laughs> F it as clear as day. But I'm thinking, like, maybe that wasn't on the air. Maybe it was the speaker. Because it was, by the way, blaring on the speaker. I mean, the entire crowd is going crazy. And, this is the greatest. And I'm thinking, oh, my God. Did I hear that? Was it on the air? And then it was pretty obvious. I, I think I hit my box. Did that go out? And there, the room is, like, either laughing or silent. Yeah. It, yeah, it went out. And so we had to, you know, Lee, Lee had to go out after the show and do an apology written for him but the first take wasn't quite good enough because he was like i'm so sorry <laughs> i a word got out and you know so this is like post game day alone on the set the crowd's cleared out i'm like yeah the, that, that, that was the producer you know, that, that that was good it was good but just need you to not smile just be, yeah right yeah be a little more serious yeah. act like you mean it and uh -huh. then you recorded it and that was it so and that yeah, was the, the end of it. The oh Corso F-bomb at Houston. I mean, that story is is one of many. There's so many that were behind the scenes where you learn so much from the guy, from his humanity, his sense of show business and theater, but his commitment to the the sport, his passion for it, mm. commitment to players. He was the ex-coach that I work with. So you know, you've known many, and you, you, you get from them what it meant to them to have an impact on young people's lives, right? It sounds corny. You think they don't care. It's about the money and the fame and the ego. I promise you, for coaches, it's about contributing to these guys' lives, whether it's the high school level, college, NFL, even yes. you know, NFL less maybe because they're grown men and they're millionaires. But, I mean, Corso really bought and believed all that stuff and still does. And so learning from him, the commitment that he made and what it meant to him to leave, is, in his words, a piece of himself mm -hmm. and every guy who played for him was powerful. And so... I mean, there's so many lessons. Chris Fowler here uh, on the Rich Eisen Show um, here in Los Angeles calling in the national championship game on Monday night. Uh, I'll share this. I don't know if I've told you this, uh, but I'll share it on live, you know, wherever we, uh -oh. where we are. No, seriously. <laughs> so, so being at ESPN in 96 and then getting to meet a whole bunch of people and still be able to call them friends, it is truly something that I, I cherish, that, I, that you and I are, are friends and, and, you know, our wives are friends and we're all, we're all you know, hanging out. Uh, but I learned a lot about this business from from a, a handful of people, and you're one of them. Um, you know, for instance, um, just watching Dan and Keith, I picked up so much from them. Picked up uh, from Tariko doing sports centers with him that you don't have to you don't have to when you're doing a highlight describe everything. You can just talk over them and tell a story. 
I learned that from him. And one of the things I learned from watching you, and you may have even given me this tip, I, you know, if memories kind of fade, if something you just mentioned this is what sparked it, is you don't, when you're surrounded by screaming people and it's loud, you don't have to scream too. You just stay even keel and present your way in a very understated way. And you could, you could talk, I think you even told me this, you'd say, hey, you're, the microphone's right in front of you. Just talk into it. <laughs> did I it. say that? You did. You did. Because, you know, and, 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 and anytime I'm in Super Bowls and it's crazy and it's screaming, I will just, and, or on Thursday Night Football, I would just continue to just talk like this. And you can be heard. And I learned that then from thank you. your audio guy. No, I feel like sometimes we're screaming over the that. crowd in these games we do Saturday. No, people I say, know that. we can't hear you. We can't hear you. The crowd's too loud. Well, but I mean, Mike Del Tufo's the. You, I you'll did take it many times that. at Rich, and that that but, no joke. You do well like that. But I, but I learned I learned that from Chris. I learned that from you. And Chris, you I guys really do it amazing. Well, I think what's awesome. interesting when you do football like, and tennis, you know, they're they're so different. Yes, I mean, because. You, you feel like you're Augusta 18th Green. Wimbledon Center yes. Court has a glass wall because the yeah. court's right there, so you can't be open air. Yes. The open U.S. Open is open air, and you're with the people, and you can be as loud as you want. Yes, but but you don't want to be because the sports are so different. And I yeah. think college football, you know, and I've learned from from people like Al Michaels, you know, your your great friend who who was um, a mentor to me long distance, but you know. You have to pick your spots in football, even in college football, which is different than the NFL. It's different. It's it's announced differently. It's consumed differently. Um, but you can't yell for these games are four hours. You yeah, can't no. scream every time the chains are moved, right? So you have in to the pick first your quarter spots. when no. it's when you know when it, you have to be you have to modulate yes. so that when a game winning touchdown, a walk off touchdown to win a championship is scored. When you get a moment like that, yes. it would be nice Monday. I'm not counting on it. I but, hear you. you know, hey, then you, you, then you lose your stuff, but you can't do it for four hours. And so, I, but tennis is is very different. You know, you, you'd be like an idiot screaming, <laughs> you know, and, unless it's called for. And then just being able to sort of feel that. So I'm happy that you learned something oh, because I know, you I don't did. need to learn from me. But. I did. And then, of course, striking up a friendship. So here's a story I want you to tell here because I was not there. Susie and I on our wedding day um, took pictures right afterwards. So we we it's one of the things we lament is we missed the cocktail hour of our <laughs> wedding. I need you to tell the story of Dan Patrick getting um, a little bit impatient about about the service at the bar <laughs> that you were there. Right. I don't remember what he said, but okay. Dan was was what, generally what? impatient about things like that. <laughs> But but what happened again? Do you recall what um, happened on that night? I remember sitting at the same table as, right. as Dan, and I I think he was you know confused about why things were taking so long. <laughs> um, we were at this beautiful. I mean, it was a beautiful setting, the old house at Central Park, which I think wonderful. they're closing down tragically. Yeah, but, I know that we're, we're so upset it, about that. It was it was a very lovely event, um, a very civilized event. Well, did he get behind the bar? Did he start serving I, the I drinks himself? I think he himself? may have slipped behind the bar and taken matters into his own hand, which doesn't usually go over well with most bartenders, <laughs> even if you're like TV's Dan Patrick. <laughs> you know? I think he, things were not unfolding for him <laughs> Did it the get way a little... he wanted. Okay. I, I don't know if they wrestled him to the ground. I, I know that he wasn't <laughs> escorted out before dinner because he was That's sitting true. next he to me. He was there. You were at the table. I, and so th was... There was sort of a Greek chorus I, I, going on, I think, I, I, in a lot of weddings. I think, you know, Dan Dan was quick with the quip. He was. I always was. Always. And I heard again that, 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 um, that he got behind the bar because the drinks weren't coming fast enough and that he started... You know that he dispensed with the you know you know how the these weddings always have like that that silver little yes. cup that to just measure the sh the shot the the actual usage of the hard alcohol that he dispensed <laughs> with that too like this was he didn't serve me I I I I mean I, I'm not surprised okay. that that, that they right. got bothered by that but if you you given the setting we've all. I shouldn't say we've all. Okay. I've jumped behind the bar before. Have you not jumped I behind have, the bar? I've, I've, I've jumped behind the bar. Chris and I have seen Jim Kelly jump behind the bar I mean, at, a, at Hall of Fame. You do get certain privileges. I have jumped behind the bar of my friend's bar, of other bars. I mean, um, in college towns. But usually they they've invited you. me. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I've not... Just, just taking. <laughs> I've not, I've not stepped into a bunch of people wearing fancy clothes in Central Park, and and elbowed the bartender out of the way to pour drinks. That that would be uncharted territory. Oh my gosh. <laughs> so are you, uh, you're heading to the Australian Open when? When's that start for you? 
in like a couple of weeks? Uh, I'm not heading to the Australian Open. Oh, you're not? No, we're doing it from the home office. Oh, okay. In the third shift for, again. Okay. Um, so then... Not so ideal, then, but... So the college, the, I mean, the college season then bleeds, obviously, into tennis. Yes. Then you get to see it, then the yeah, French... Yeah, the Aussie Open starts the week after. Okay. Um, and then and then there's some downtime, and then... Okay, and then, you some, win, then Wimbledon. Wimbledon feels like a long time off, but yeah, there'll be some... Is downtime. Serena done? What do you think? Didn't she? I do think so, yeah. You do think so? I think, I think at the, this point, you know, it's, it's one of those transition times when those of us that have covered tennis, since they were young players, Serena and Federer, you know, finally, you know, north of 40, 41. Right. Um, I think they got to look at what was going on in the sport at the, at the next-gen level. I mean, mm-hmm. I, Roger, you couldn't watch U.S. Open and not go, oh, wow, Carlos Alcaraz has arrived. And wow. he's 19 and Yannick Sinner. Not even to mention like Medvedev and and Zverev and, and there's a roster of guys sort of this generation who sort of like were were reinventing themselves and I would say elevating the game. Well, in front of our eyes. and Ro- Roger goes, "Oh yeah, no." I right. mean, doubles with Rafa at the Labor Cup as a swan song was emotional, perfect, but he's covering like half the court to get out there. I, I think no one wants to see, of course, a great champion be unable to do it and have that be the lasting memory. So. But, I mean, one of the great U.S. Open moments ever was watching Connors in his late stages yeah. do what he was doing. And in there were shades of that um, significantly with with Serena this past year. was 100%. just unbelievable. That, that's a good parallel. I mean, Connors was 39, but he also got stopped in the quarters, right? right. He won some matches. Correct. But when, when reality hit in the form of Jim Courier, our, our buddy, it hit real hard. Yes, but it was a magical run. I mean, Serena, I don't think she wants to stick around and play to make their quarters around a 16, but it was it was an amazing event by her. It it it, it put the place on fire when she, when she came and made that final push, and I think it was it was powerful. So that is unreal, uh, unbelievable, and you're great at it. And I can't wait to you. watch you. And well, I'll I'll be at the game, so I'll, I'll miss your call. I'm bringing Coop on Monday. That's night. awesome. I'll be at the, the fact game. that we can be friends and it means as much to me as it does to you. And, and you, you're now, you know, bringing your three kids around to games. And I can remember like pre kids, you know, I know. <laughs> I remember the, you know, Xander's very early years and Cooper, obviously, you yeah, know, uh, so that it, it's cool. That you can have that, that kind of moment at the game. I, and nice. I, absolutely. I mean, as we just established you and Jen were, uh, were at the wedding. Um, Linda Cohn was at the table. Tariko was at, t- <laughs> at the table. Stuart was at the table. Mm. Uh, and Dan, how many lifetimes ago does that feel like, you know? Oh, I mean, it's 20 years coming up. Yeah. 20 years. Uh, thanks for coming in. No, my pleasure. Appreciate Had it. Blast. Thank you. Absolutely. Everybody. Oh, and your pod? Are you you're doing we're your pod? We're still doing the, the Fowler Who You Got podcast. is in a hiatus. Okay. But we're bringing back season six. Season six? Yeah, it was fun. We had, we had, we had Johnny Mac on, and we, we, we talk about things that are outside of the normal realm. There it realm is right and, there. And okay. uh, we had... Um, had the, the lethal shooter, who basketball fans will know who that guy is. He's the shooting coach to the the stars, and mm-hmm. and he he's gonna work with me on my shot. But he he was we have, we have all kinds of people that I that I enjoy knowing. And James Clear, who wrote uh, Atomic Habits, the global bestseller, is the current guest on right now. Jennifer's so, producing so it. Was she you, is right? co-producing it. Okay, yeah. fantastic. We're yeah. all podcasts required. I look forward to season Thanks, six. Man. Season man. six, yeah. And then national championship game number nine. Yes. Uh, fantastic. Chris Fowler right here on the Rich Eisen Show. Everybody uh, follow this man on Instagram. Some very No, I'm serious. You have some very deep. Um, no, you, Chris, you do. You do. You give you, you give yourself, man. And you and, and then we also never know when you're going to be seen uh, without your shoes. It's on, a combination uh, the of self-indulgence and self-expression, which Look I think is grounding. what social media is. I don't know. We, we don't go for deep, but. There it is. Namaste, Rich. There Namaste. you are grounding. There you are grounding. we got to have you sign those seats. Chris Fowler, thank you, sir. Good to see you. Catch the Rich Eisen Show every single day on the Roku channel, 12 to 3 Eastern, for free.